Hello and welcome to the podcast. This is Ron's Amazing Stories. We have stories that should thrill you a little and chill you a little. It's amazing. What you'll hear are adventures sent in by you guys, classic stories from the pulp mags, and episodes from the golden age of radio. We have special segments like Ghost Stories with Sylvia. That's amazing. And these are your stories. So settle in for the next hour and enjoy the show. One more thing. You just might want to prepare yourself to be taken away from today. Another five-minute mystery. This five minute mystery is being brought to you by horror. Life can be filled with the things of horror, but it can have no power over us unless we let it. Unlike these five minute mysteries that are quite horrific in their own right. That's true. That is true. Let's get to today's story. Midnight. A penthouse on one of Manhattan's skyscrapers, owned by wealthy Roger Hammond. In the dim light of his library, Hammond studies a group of papers on his desk. Then comes a knock on the door. Come in. Who is it? I can't see you in this blasted darkness, so come in. What do you want? You've got a gun. In heaven's name, don't point that thing at me. Stop it, do you hear? Stop it! Come in, Mrs. Hammond. Thank you, Inspector Mills. I flew back from Uruguay as soon as I got your telegram. Will you sit down? Roger's death is the most shocking thing that could have happened to me. Who could have done this awful murder? I wish I knew, Mrs. Hammond. Of course, we'll do everything we can. Now, there are a few questions I'd like to ask. Merely routine, of course. Anything I can tell you, Inspector. This friend of your husband, Stanley Macon, was there any friction between them? Oh, no, never. They were the best of friends. Macon was alone at his hunting lodge in Maine when the murder occurred. And I was so far away. If only I'd been here. Exactly why did you go to Uruguay, Mrs. Hammond? Business for Roger. And because I'd never been to South America, he thought it'd be a kind of vacation for me. Mm-hmm. Been there only two days when I received your wire telling me what happened. Yes. Do you mind telling me what your plans are? Will you take over Mr. Hammond's enterprises? Oh, I don't know. I, I suppose so. I haven't been able to think of anything these last few days. So hard to believe he's gone. Then I suppose I I was warned of it in a way. What do you mean? Well, it's one of those things that's hard to explain. A, a terrible presentiment I had. One evening in Uruguay, the night of his murder. Tell me about it. It's really nothing, Inspector. In murder, everything is important, Mrs. Hammond. I'd gone for an automobile ride all alone. The moon was shining very brightly, and I was speeding, I'm afraid. But I'm a careful driver. I always keep far to the right. And that night, I made a point of it because I was speeding. But suddenly, in the center of the right lane, I saw the figure of a man. I slammed on the brakes, and I was terrified to see in the headlights that the man was Roger. I swerved and ran the car off the road and stopped. You must have been terribly frightened. Oh, I was. But I climbed out and ran back to the highway, and on the whole stretch of road, there wasn't anybody at all. And I could see clearly in the moonlight. I know you won't believe me. You're right, I don't. Because you're lying, Mrs. Hammond. Lying? Why, what do you mean? I mean you were never in Uruguay at all. I'm going to hold you for questioning, and perhaps for murder. What was the clue that made Inspector Mills know Tony Hammond was not telling the truth? In a moment, we'll hear, but first... Well, I'm happy about one thing. And what might that be? The end of the story, perhaps? Well, yeah. But the detective didn't say that he was going to charge her with murder, at least. I agree. After all, she was telling him a dream. Yep. And as far as I know, they're not legally binding. But still what, in that dream, tipped the detective off? British guy, I have no freaking idea. Well, let's listen to the rest then. If we must. And now, the solution to our mystery. Mrs. Hammond stayed behind in New York, 
killed her husband, and supposedly returned from South America to tell me about her strange presentiment. She said she was driving on the right side of the road. So I knew she couldn't have been to Uruguay, or she'd have known that Uruguay is the only country in the Western Hemisphere where driving on the left still prevails. Driving on which side of the road? The left, I believe. Well, let me just Google that. Please do. Aha! According to the great Google, Uruguay drives on the right side of the road. Mrs. Hammond is vindicated. Bravo. I agree. And it was quite shocking that the FMM got it so wrong. Is it? Is it really? Hello, and welcome to the podcast. Today on the show, we have stories. It's a good thing. A great thing. Yes, it is. We have three ghost stories from you guys. A cast party that is haunted, a child argues with a ghost, and smoking is bad for you. How fun! Our featured story is full of twists. Are we dancing? Not that kind of twist. On an episode of The Mysterious Traveler, a woman is being blackmailed. The resolution is, well, surprising. That sounds pretty good. It is. And finally, we have a new edition of Not So Important Times in History. Alrighty then. But before we get to all that stuff, I wanted to let everyone know that we just hit 640 subscribers to the weekly written blog. This is separate from the podcast. Each Tuesday, I post a new article. This week, I told a story about a turkey hunt interrupted by wolves or maybe something else. If you want to read the blog, head to the main website and click on the blog tab at the top of the screen. Once there, you can subscribe to it and join in on the fun. Now let's get to the show with this review from Audible. Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash Ron's Amazing Stories. Audible has sponsored the show now since July of 2019. We have reviewed more than 140 audiobooks, and the list keeps growing. Did you know that Audible has over 200,000 books available? And a lot of those are included in the free catalog. Audible is amazing, and it is the perfect companion to Ron's Amazing Stories. If you like this podcast, you're going to love Audible. So what am I listening to? He Who Fights With Monsters, book one by Sherta Loon and Travis Deverall. It's narrated by Heath Miller. Jason wakes up in a mysterious world of magic and monsters. There is a new genre of books out there. The LIT RPG, which is short for Literary Role-Playing Games, combines the conventions of computer games with science fiction and fantasy novels. The term was introduced in 2013. The Lit RPG uses game-like challenges to form an essential part of the story and even uses visible statistics, for example, strength, intelligence, damage, are all a significant part of the reading experience. This is different from novels based on actual games like Halo and Resident Evil. Typically, the main character in a lit RPG novel is consciously interacting with the game or game-like world and is attempting to progress or level within it. The main characters are transported into a game-like world from our world and can also remember the real world. 
Now, I know that sounds confusing. And I have to tell you that these types of books are incredibly hard for me to read. However, the audiobook version is nothing short of amazing. Our book today is one of these lit RPGs. He Who Fights With Monsters begins with our hero, Jason. It's not easy making the career jump from office supply store middle manager to heroic interdimensional adventurer. At least Jason tries to be heroic, but it's hard to be good when all of your powers are evil. Here's a clip from the opening of this amazing story. Jason woke up naked, face down in the grass. That was not how he expected to wake up, since he had gone to sleep in his own bed and his own Darth Vader boxer shorts. From the feel of the cool grass on his unmentionables, he had been removed from his bed and shorts both. The last thing he recalled was doing what he did most nights, playing video games until he got tired and then fumbling his way into bed. The grass he woke up on was weirdly comfortable, a dense bed of lush green softness. It wasn't like any grass he had encountered before, which was a little unusual. His father was a landscape architect, and Jason had grown up learning more about grass than he ever wanted to know, mostly because it was the only escape from his mother's Japanese lessons. Jason rolled himself over and sat up. He was feeling odd, beyond just the unusual circumstances. It wasn't a bad sensation, more like waking up after a really long sleep. There was the lingering sopa, but also a feeling of refreshed energy. He ran a hand over his head, only to be startled when he realized his hair was missing. Uh. He felt about his head with both hands, but his head was balloon smooth. He made a quick check with his eyes and hands, realizing there was no hair anywhere on his body. No eyebrows, nothing on his chest, or arms, or other places. I thought it was meant to look bigger when you trimmed. He pushed himself to his feet and started assessing his environment. Casting his gaze to the sky, he saw that the sun was high and the air was warm. The sky was unbroken blue, the blazing orb burning away so much as the merest hint of cloud. Sunburn, more than cold, was likely to threaten his exposed extremities. Looking around, he saw that he was boxed in between two long, tall hedges. Glancing up and down the dead straight lane, side junctions headed off at sharp right angles in either direction. The lane itself was wide and grassy, with plenty of room for unconscious sprawling. The hedge walls were meticulously trimmed. After an unhappy glance down at his bald, naked body, he set off at random to explore. He quickly discovered he was in a hedge maze, the living walls cultivated to almost twice Jason's height. Jason's first thought was to climb one to get a better sense of his location, but a closer examination of the hedges changed his mind. Instead of the usual boxwood, the hedges were something very prickly, and he was very naked. He looked up and down the path he was on, with neither direction looking any better than the other. What the bloody hell is going on? As if in response to his question, something appeared in front of him. It looked like a touchscreen, floating in the air, disembodied. He reached out to touch it with an experimental finger, the screen shimmering as his finger passed straight through. Hologram? He looked at the ground and nearby hedges for some kind of projector, but as he started moving, the screen followed. There was text on the screen, which he read. New Quest Stranger in a Strange Land You have awoken in a place you do not know. Explore the area to discover more. Objective Explore the hedge maze. Zero of one. Reward Simple Pants Huh. He looked around suspiciously. He carefully probed the pointy foliage of the hedge walls, looking for hidden cameras. Looking up at the sky, he didn't spot any camera drones. What he did notice was the moon, pale and easy to overlook in the daylight. Then he noticed another moon. That can't be right. Jason looked down at the floating screen, then back up at the sky. 
Still, two moons. Am I going nuts? Jason sat down on the grass, unsure what to do. He kept glancing up at the sky and the extra moon. In front of him, the screen still waited patiently. This is crazy. I mean, a quest? I'm not a level one sorcerer. Another screen appeared next to the first. Jason Asano. Race, Outworlder. Current rank, normal. Progression to iron rank, 0%, 0 of 4 essences. Attributes, power, no essence, normal. Speed, no essence, normal. Spirit, no essence, normal. Recovery, no essence, normal. Racial abilities, Outworlder. Interface, quest system, inventory, map, astral affinity, mysterious stranger. Essences, 0 of 4. No essence, no attribute, 0 of 5. 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 Is this a character sheet? Am I meant to understand any of this? He shook his head in bewilderment. It could have at least gone with a game system I know. He looked over the screen again. Map, he read, latching onto something familiar. I know what maps are. How do I see the map? A new screen obligingly appeared. But as it was the third screen, the space in front of him was getting crowded. He absently thought it would be convenient for the other screens to close, which they immediately did. I'm sure that's good. Things were getting harder to explain away, even ignoring the extra moon. Some kind of voice command hologram was implausible, but not impossible. Mental command holograms were something else entirely. I'm becoming increasingly concerned. Also, I'm talking to myself a lot. I'm sure that's fine, and definitely not a defense mechanism to stave off panic. If you enjoyed that clip, you're going to love the rest of the book. Jason will face off against cannibals, cultists, wizards, monsters. And that's just the first day. He's going to need courage. He's going to need wit. He's going to need some magical powers of his own. But first, he's going to need pants. After cementing itself as one of the best-rated serial novels on Royal Road with an astonishing 13 million views, he who fights with monsters is now brought to you in a professionally formatted audiobook. And if that appeals to you, head to audibletrial.com slash Ron's Amazing Stories and you can have it for free. Here's what Audible has set up for us. They are offering a free audiobook in 30 days to give you the opportunity to check out their service. This also gains you access to the included catalog, which is updated constantly with new titles. So, to download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com slash Ron's Amazing Stories. Thank you, Audible. And now, it's time for your stories. These are your stories, sent by you, for you. Our first story comes from Apple Sharon of Boston. I wrote back to Apple about her name. She told me that her parents met in an apple orchard the night that she came into being, they decided that that would be her name. For the record, her full legal name is Apple Orchard Sharon, and here is her story. Hey Ron, so this happened a bit ago. I was in my high school production of Oklahoma. We had a cast party the last night at the school. My friends and others were there from about 7 p.m. to 10 p.m. Near the end of the night, I left the party to go to the bathroom. As I was in the cubicle, I heard a man and woman speaking just outside the door. As far as I knew, I was the only one in there. I was nervous, so I kept quiet. They just wouldn't leave. 
Finally, I decided to let them know I was in there. Everything went quiet, but I didn't hear the bathroom door open or close. I slowly opened the stall door and found the room completely empty. I headed back to my friends only to see them all bolting down the stairs towards me. They had all heard strange noises and screaming. Even the drama teacher and chaperones came flying out of the party room. A few of us went back up there to check things out. There was no one up there, and no one downstairs either, so we decided to end the party and go home. I never found out why or whatever happened. Apple Sharon, Boston, Massachusetts Well, Apple, that is an amazing story. An entire party of people having the same experiences got to be so very rare. I don't think we've ever had anything like this on the podcast before. I guess it could have been a major prank, but that doesn't explain your experience. So very strange. Thank you for sharing it. This next story comes from Brinks302. Sorry, that's all I have. I do believe that Brinks is female and probably lives in or near Chicago. The IP address indicated that. Brinks has titled her story, The Terrible Two. Hi Ron, due to a completely separate spooky child situation that I've recently experienced, My sister recounted an incident that she had years ago with her then-boyfriend's nephew. When she was in her late teens, she used to regularly babysit the child. He was maybe two or three years old at the time and was going through a phase that I'm sure many people are familiar with. He would pick up random things and present them to people. He would then say, Take. He could get quite insistent. He was also going through some separation anxiety and would also say back when people would leave the room or house. One day they're in the living room and he picks up a frisbee and walks to the corner of the room and proudly presents it to thin air. Take, he crowded. Then he looked frustrated. Take. Then he really starts to get upset, shaking the frisbee in front of him, stomping his feet, yelling, Take! Take! After a few moments, he turns towards the doorway leading into the main hallway, toddles in that direction until he's standing at the foot of the stairs. He starts crying, back, back, back. Well, my sister said she whipped on her shoes and coat, and they immediately left the house, waiting for hours until her boyfriend's brother got home. Brinks 302, maybe from Chicago. Well, okay then. I've heard many times that kids can see things that we adults cannot. So I, for one, think your sister may have made a very good decision. Thank you, Brinks, for your story. Our last story comes from another school experience. It was sent in by Randall Shield, who lives in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. Randall has titled his story, the haunted washroom. Our school has an outside washroom on the grounds that no one uses. It's because it's not kept up and is quite dirty. However, it is a great place to hide out and a place where all the best crimes happen. I stopped going near the place after I was in the sixth grade, and here's why. Me and my boys thought we would give smoking cigarettes a try. It took a bit of trading, but we got enough smokes for all of us. So during recess, all four of us went to the place and did the deed. It tasted so bad that all four of us immediately threw the crap away, and so all that time and money went to waste. Skip forward a couple months later. I thought that maybe it tasted so bad because it was my first time, so I went back there to try again. After forcing myself to at least smoke half of it, I gave it up because it still tasted terrible. 
I was about to leave when I saw a kind of misty apparition in front of me which looked somewhat like the shape of a girl. At first, I thought it was just the smoke because it disappeared, but while walking out, I heard footsteps. When I turned back, I saw a girl in our school uniform. Her face was ghostly pale and wasn't quite human. I started walking faster, got out of that place, and never went back. Later I learned that during the construction of the terrace on our second school building, four girls had secretly snuck up there during recess. They wanted a thrill and to enjoy the pleasant weather. All of them sat on the unprotected ledge so that they could look down at the kids playing below. While talking about random stuff, a big insect came out of nowhere. One of the girls got scared, lost her balance, and fell to her death. She landed right in front of that old washroom. Ron, I believe her soul is not at peace, and she definitely haunts that washroom. I'm 18 years old now, and I'm going to graduate this June. I never tried smoking again, and I've never been back to that washroom. The building is still there, but it's all boarded up now. I heard that there is a plan to demo the place and build a greenhouse. I hope the girl likes her new digs. Randall Shield, Chapel Hill, North Carolina. Well, Randall, I have another thought on this one. Perhaps the girl also had something to do with the taste of your smokes. Who can say? Thank you for sharing your story. Well, that's it for this time. If you have a story that you want to share, head to the main website at ronsamazingstories.com. Click on the story submission banner, leave your story, give it a title, and please tell me where you're from. I'll read it if I can. Our featured story comes from one of the best series of the golden age of radio, The Mysterious Traveler. It was an anthology radio series, a magazine, and even a comic book. All three of these featured stories which ran the gambit from fantasy and science fiction to straight crime dramas of mystery and suspense. One of their trademarks was the twist. That ending or plot upheaval that you just never see coming. Our story today has not only one of these, but two. Just when you think things are settled? Well, not so much. The story is titled Out of the Past and stars some of the best character actors of the era. It first aired on the Mutual Broadcasting System on April 20th, 1944. The Mutual Broadcasting System presents The Mysterious Traveler, written, produced, and directed by Robert A. Arthur and David Cogan, and starring tonight two of radio's foremost personalities, Santos Ortega and Ann Shepard, in Out of the Past. This is the mysterious traveler inviting you to join me on another journey into the realm of the strange and the terrifying. I hope you will enjoy the trip, that it will thrill you a little and chill you a little. So settle back, get a good grip on your nerves, and be comfortable, if you can, as you hear out of the past. Your name is Joan Morgan. And as you stand looking over Central Park from your penthouse terrace on this beautiful spring day, you can't help but feel you're the luckiest woman living. You're young, attractive, fairly wealthy, and happily married to a Broadway actor. Yes, Joan, there's little more you could ask for. The doorbell rings. You run to the door to greet your husband, Keith, who is home from his matinee performance. Hello, 
beautiful. How's my one and only? Hello, darling. <laughs> oh, Keith, no wonder every actress wants to have you for her leading man. Nonsense. I'll have you know the only person I kiss like that is my wife. <laughs> Better say that. How is the matinee today? Fine. I got seven curtain calls. Oh, here's the afternoon mail. I picked it up at the desk. Oh, anything for me? I haven't looked it over there. Oh, yes, here's one for me. The other's for you, dear. Let's see. Hmm. This one's a bill from hotel management. Darling, we're living beyond our means. Oh, please. You're not going to start that again, are you? Oh, we have over half a million dollars. I've told you a dozen times I won't touch that money. It's yours, not mine. Darling, it isn't a question of it being yours or mine. It's ours. Joan, I made it clear to you when we got married that we'd have to live on the money I earn. Then what'll I do with my money if you won't allow me to spend it? Well, someday we'll have six children. You can save us for that. (laughs) (laughs) All right, darling. I wonder who my letter can be from. You rip open the envelope, Joan, as Keith looks at the rest of his mail. For a moment you feel as if your heart has stopped, and it begins to beat wildly. Over and over you read the two sentences. A friend from Europe expects you tomorrow afternoon at 2 o'clock at the Hotel Edgewood. Please bring $25,000 in cash, or else I shall be forced to take action. John Benedict. Joan, what is it? What's wrong, darling? Uh, what did you say? You look so upset. Is it that letter you're reading? Letter? No. No. Well, then, if it isn't the letter, what is it? It's nothing, darling, nothing at all. It's just that I have a headache. Oh, I'm sorry. Can I get you something? No, Keith, no, no. I'll be all right. All I need is a little rest. Come in, won't you, Joan? Sorry to keep you waiting. Martin, you must help me. Why, of course, Joan. You know I'd do anything for you. Sit down and tell me about it. Martin, I'm in trouble. I'm in great trouble. Joan, what is it? What's wrong? I'm being blackmailed. Blackmailed? Yes. By whom? A man named John Benedict. I don't know who he is. But I received a letter from him yesterday afternoon. There's only one thing to do, and that's to go to the police. I'll call the district no, attorney. No, 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 no. I, I, I can't go to the police. Why not? This... This man, Benedict, knows something I can't afford to have exposed. What does he know, Joe? Please, don't don't ask me. I, I know that you were my father's best friend, but I can't tell you. Believe me, if it... If it ever gets out, it would ruin my marriage. My life... I, I couldn't stand to lose Keith. I couldn't. I'd rather die. All right, Joan. I think you're making a mistake, but I'll help you. How much money does this man Benedict want? A half hour later, you enter a dingy hotel and go to room 14. As Martin opens the door, he reveals a squalid, dimly lit room. For the first time, Joan, you see John Benedict. He's a tall, heavy man with coarse features and a thick black beard. In the half-light, he appears to be about 50. His clothes are of fine English cut, but time and wear have taken their toll. He stares at you for a moment, Joan, then speaks. How do you do, Mrs. Morgan? Won't you please come in? Thank you. This is Mr. Walker, friend. Yes, yes, of course. I trust you will forgive me these dismal surroundings, but alas, I am quite penniless. So you thought it would be an excellent idea to blackmail this lady for funds? I am afraid you misunderstand me, Mr. Walker. I am not forcing this beautiful lady to give me 5,000 pounds. Rather, I am, shall we say, requesting a loan. Yes, but if she doesn't give you this loan, you'll ruin her marriage or her life. It would distress me to ruin anyone's life. But then it also distresses me to live in a pigsty like this. A much more suitable place would be the state penitentiary. Martin, please don't talk like that. 
Evidently, Mrs. Morgan, your friend is more interested in having me placed in prison than in saving you from disaster. I'm afraid you have not revealed our little secret to Mr. Walker. No. No, I haven't. Well, then, perhaps if we were to tell him, he would not be quite so eager to imprison me. Perhaps if he knew that at one time you had... No, no, no. Don't pay any more. I'll pay you. Allow me to commend you on your good judgment. Martin, give him the money. Give it to him. Very well. Here's your filthy blood money. Thank you. I think you have been very wise, Mrs. Morgan. Very wise indeed. Good day. In the weeks that follow, Joan, you try to forget Mr. Benedict and the terrifying secret he shares with you. But you aren't successful, are you? Everywhere you go, you unconsciously find yourself fearfully looking for him. Life has become tense, frightening. Then one afternoon, while Keith is at rehearsal of a new play, you receive a phone call. A call that sends you in a panic to Martin Walker's office. Martin, I've heard from him again. Benedict? Yes, he phoned an hour ago. He wants $50,000. $50,000? Maybe now you'll have sense enough to let me turn this over to the police. No, I can't do that. You mean you're going to buy him off a second time? Yes, I must. But you can't. What's to prevent his extorting money from you a third or a fourth time? He'll squeeze you dry. The money doesn't matter, do you hear? Nothing matters but keeping what Benedict knows from Keith. If Keith finds out, it'll mean the end of everything for me. Everything. <laughs> Good afternoon, Mrs. Morgan. Oh, I see you brought Mr. Walker. And I was counting on a pleasant afternoon. May I take your call? No. Thank Benedict, you. what do you mean by asking for $50,000? We paid you 25000 That was supposed to keep your mouth shut. Well, it has. Up to now. But as you can see by this suite of rooms, Mr. Walker, it takes money to live lavishly. Therefore, I shall need more. Well, you shan't have it. We paid you off once. We're not paying you off again. There's a limit to what anyone will pay. Yes, quite true, Mr. Walker. But the limit has not been reached as yet. You swine. If I had my way, I'd call the police and put you where you belong. Mrs. Morgan, I'm afraid you are allowing your friend to go too far. I have but to pick up this telephone, and your world will come crashing down about. No, don't do that. Don't do that. Don't, don't. Martin, give him the money. But Joan, give you... it to him. <laughs> Very well. Here it is, Benedict. But I warn you, you'd better not try anything further. There is such a thing as pushing a person too far. I shall try to remember that, Mr. Walker. Thank you for your advice. And the money. You're trembling with fear as you leave Benedict's luxurious suite, aren't you, Joan? And even when you reach your own apartment, the fear hasn't left you. Weeks pass, and life is a nightmare. Every time someone knocks at the door or the phone rings, your heart begins to beat wildly. And worst of all, Keith senses something is wrong. I'll answer it, But I'm much closer to it there. Hello? This is the Morgan's apartment. Yes? This is the stage manager of the theater. Will you please remind Mr. Morgan of the special matinee we're giving today? Uh, yes. Yes, I'll tell him. It was a theater calling, Keith, to remind you of today's special performance. I haven't forgotten. It's only five or two. I still have a few minutes before I have to leave. Joan. Yes. What is it, darling? What's come over you? Come over me? Yes. These past weeks, you've been just a bundle of nerves. Every time the phone rings or the mail arrives, you begin to tremble. What's wrong? Darling, you're just imagining all that. Don't stop acting as though I were a child. I can see something's wrong, and I want to know what it is. Please, please. There's nothing. Who could that be? Never mind, I'll get it. No, you just please, I would rather... Rest. Look, darling, you have to get to the... To the... Taking too long. Why doesn't he come there? Keith? Who is it? Keith! Joan, what is it? 
How did you scream like that? I I didn't scream. Who was that at the door? Well, it was just a special delivery boy. He brought a special delivery for you. Special delivery? Yes, here. Thank you. Aren't you going to open it? After all, it is a special delivery. Yes. Of course. I just saw anyone so afraid of a letter. Who's it from? Joan, what's wrong? Nothing. 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 Don't tell me that. You look as though you were going to collapse. Now, give me that letter. No, no, no. I said, please, give it to me. No, please. Yeah, that's better. Perhaps this letter will tell me what's wrong. Well, it's only one sentence. I will phone you at two. There isn't even a signature. Who wrote this note, Joan? I don't know. You must know, else why would you have grown so pale? Only you were two. Almost two now. I'll wait for that call. Please. Please. You must have faith in me. All these weeks I've had faith, said nothing, hoping you'd tell me what was wrong. Now I must find out for myself. Well, right on time. Please. Just two o'clock. Please, don't answer. Take your phone. Take your hand off the phone, Please, Joan. Please, no. I said I won't take your hand off the it. phone. No. Hello? 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 My answer. Another call hung up when they heard my voice. <laughs> I suppose you won't tell me who it is? <laughs> All right, then. I have to leave for the matinee now. I won't be home for dinner, but when I return after tonight's performance, we'll have this out once and for all. Please. Please. I just can't tell you. If you'd only Goodbye, wait. Joan. Keep. <laughs> I can't. Oh, darling. If only I could tell you. If only I could. <laughs> but I know you wouldn't want me then. How could you? How could you with you? You'd leave me alone. That I'd never hear from you again. That was only a month ago. Yes, I know. Ah, but then, I am always making promises. I cannot. You've ruined everything. Everything. My husband read the special delivery letter you sent. He answered the phone when you called a few minutes ago. How can I explain? Oh, that should not be too difficult for a clever woman like yourself. And you are a clever woman. Are you not? What do you want? I'm tired of your playing cat and mouse with me. I intend to call on you at 5.30 this afternoon. I won't pay you another cent for you here. There's no end to your demand. You may expect me at 5.30. No. And do not have Walker then. No, I won't see you. I won't. Hello. 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 I won't see you. <laughs> Good afternoon, Mrs. Morgan. As you can see, I am right on time. It's exactly 5.30. This is a lovely penthouse you have. It's good to see you without walking around. How can you do this to me? I've never harmed you. Why do you insist on ruining my life? Why? My dear lady, the last thing I desire to do is to ruin your life. Unfortunately, the world you and I live in being what it is, I am forced by circumstances to live by my wits. If I give you the money now, how do I know you won't be back in the next Oh, oh that is very simple. Because after you pay me off this time, there would not be any point in my bothering you again. What do you mean? I mean, Mrs. Morgan, that this time I want a half million dollars. A half million dollars? Yes. If I am not mistaken, that is what the balance of your fortune amounts to. You cannot see. Once you have paid it over to me, there would be no point in my bothering you anymore. Simple. Is it not? You must be mad. I? Oh, no, Mrs. Morgan. Not I. 
Come now, you love your husband and he loves you. There are years and years of happiness before you. If he does not learn your little secret, you are wise. You will send the money over to me. I can't. I can't. If I were to withdraw half a million, he'd find out about it. Ah, but there is always the chance that he won't. You do not do as I ask. I shall be forced to reveal the secret. No. No. Yes, Mrs. Morgan. Your husband will learn that while you were in England in 1939, you murdered your... Uh, sweet. I won't listen. I won't listen. But your husband will. And he will learn that after you committed this murder, you spent the following eight years in an English insane asylum. No. No, you can't tell him. You can't. Think of what a sensation the tabloids will make out of it. And think of what people will say. No. Your husband no, would have no. to divorce no. That is not going to help you, Mrs. Morgan. Martin, I just got your message at the theater. Where's Joan? What's wrong? She's in her bedroom with Dr. Richards. It seems that she... Here's Dr. Richards now. Doctor... What's wrong? Keith, you must prepare yourself for a shock. What's happened? Half hour ago, one of your neighbors on the floor heard Joan weeping and screaming hysterically. The manager knew I was your doctor and sent for me. But, but why was she weeping and screaming? She's had a breakdown. Uh, breakdown? Yes. Well, I want to see her. I must. Very well, Keith, but only for a moment. Mr. Walker, I'm afraid you'll have to wait here. I understand that. Uh, Keith, you must keep a grip on yourself. Oh, no. Joan. <laughs> Darling. It's Keith. Stay away from me. Stay away, both of you. You don't come near me. Doctor. You... She doesn't even recognize me. Yes, Keith, I know. I know who you are. You can't fool me. One of you is Mr. Benedict. Maybe both of you are Mr. Benedict. Yes. I know what you're here for, but I won't let you. I won't let you. She's completely out of her mind. I yes, know yes, you're yes. both Mr. Benedict. You can't fool me. Who is this Benedict she, she keeps talking about? I don't know, Keith. Yes, yes. Still, she's being persecuted by this Benedict fellow. He may be real, and again, he may be a figment of her imagination. Yes. She's definitely afraid of her. Yes, she sees everyone as this fellow Benedict. I tried to give her a sedative, but she, she grows violent when I approach. Well, can't, can't you do something for her? I've already sent for an ambulance. She'd be much better off in a hospital where she can have constant medical care. Come along, Keith. How is she, Doctor? Well, it may be a long time before she recovers. I'm going down to the lobby, wait for the ambulance. I suggest you two stay here. Keep an eye on her. I left the door to her room open. All right, Doctor. Shouldn't be more than a few minutes. How do you feel, Keith? <sighs> Tired, if you want to know. Well, it's only natural. These past two months have been quite strenuous for you. But with a half million dollars and a wife who'll probably never be in any condition to ask you about it, you've done quite well. Quite well? That's an understatement. Name one actor, living or dead. Who could have given as great a performance of Mr. Benedict as I did? You were superb as Benedict, I admit. Superb? Why, I was magnificent. The costume, the makeup, my accent, simply perfect. I tell you, it was the greatest performance ever given. What a pity you weren't here at 5.30 this afternoon. I'm sure I missed the performance of the age. I outdid myself. You should have heard me. Yes, Mrs. Morgan. Your husband will learn that while you were in England in 1939, you murdered your, uh, sweetheart. That after you committed this murder, you spent the following eight years in an English insane asylum. Ah, it's really a pity I've played my greatest role to an audience of one. Well, yes, Keith, but you're probably the highest paid actor in the world. I'm sure that a half million dollars for two months' work, or less my share, of course, is something of a record. <laughs> yes, it probably is. I hurt you, Mr. Benedict. But, oh. You can't fool me. 
Come on. I know one of you is Mr. Benedict. Or are you both Mr. Benedict? Yes, you both must be Mr. Benedict. That's clever. Yeah, that disguise you use, that's clever. But you can't fool me. She must have overheard you. That brought her out of the room. Yes, no matter how many disguises you use, I know you. No, 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 don't you come near me. Don't come near me. She, she's got don't a gun. Don't. Me. Put that gun down. I'm not going to let you tell. I'm not going to let no, you No, don't. Tell. Don't, Joe. Stop. <laughs> you, you shot me. <laughs> oh, Joe, no. I'm not Mr. Benedict. He's not. <laughs> <laughs> You'll never tell Keith now. Never, never, never. <laughs> This is the mysterious traveler again. Did you enjoy our trip? Too bad about poor Keith and Martin. Such interesting scoundrels. That fellow Keith was certainly a remarkable actor, wasn't he? But uh, like so many actors, he overplayed his role. Uh, with fatal results. What happened to Joan Morgan? Well, the poor woman was committed to an institution. Where after several years of treatment, she was covered completely. However, she still has that deathly fear of acting. Oh, you'll have to get off here, I'm sorry. But I'm sure we'll meet again. I take this same train every week at the same time. You've just heard The Mysterious Traveler, a series of dramas of the strange and terrifying. The role of The Mysterious Traveler is played by Maurice Tarpley. Others in the cast were Santos Ortega, Ann Shepard, and Roger DeCoven. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Well, did you see those twists coming? Or were you as startled as I was? My hope is the latter. The lead actor in this one was Shindel Kalish. But wait, you say, you don't remember that name in the credits. And you won't because that is her real name. Shindel was an American actress on stage, on old time radio, and in films. She was known at various times as Judith Blake, Anne Shepard, Anne Preston, Judith Preston Blake, Anne S. Sheps, and Anne Shepherd Mann. Now you might ask why so many names? She was the victim of the Hollywood Blacklist. The Hollywood Blacklist was the colloquial term for what was, in actuality, a broader entertainment industry blacklist put into effect in the mid-20th century in the United States during the early years of the Cold War. The blacklist involved the practice of denying employment to entertainment industry professionals believed to be or have been communist or communist sympathizers. In her case, Nothing was ever proven, or for that matter, found to be true, so the producers kept changing her name to keep her busy. When she passed away in 2002, her final name was listed as Anne Kalish Sheps, for reasons only known to her. How about that? Not-so-important times in history. In this segment, we take a look at historical events that may otherwise go unnoticed. 
We look at history with a fish-eyed lens, giving a perspective that should provide no insight to anyone or any time. But it is historical, or hysterical, as the case may be. Join us now for this event in history. I think most of us these days have forgotten about the mail. You know, those useless ads that show up in our physical mailboxes? There was a day when the mail was something more. In the cities, people have been receiving mail at home since 1863, but rural Americans had to trek dozens of miles to their nearest post office, not even knowing if there was any mail waiting for them or not. When Congress voted for Rural Free Delivery, or RFD, politicians hoped that daily mail delivery could get vital information to farmers and ease the isolation of farm life. Millions of rural people eagerly subscribed to daily newspapers and monthly magazines once RFD made it affordable. And mail order catalogs that came in through the post put some of the luxuries of urban life within reach of rural families. Wristwatches, French lace, electric toasters. I mean, who can really live without toast in the morning? However, RFD had some unintended consequences too. When farmers stopped traveling to town to get the mail and started shopping in catalogs, local businesses suffered because it proved difficult for postmen to navigate narrow, muddy roads, the federal government devoted funds to improved post roads, first in 1916 and then again in 1936. This made a vast difference for the rural people's ability to take their crops to market and to send their children to school. Rural free delivery cost the federal government $40 million a year in 1910. That money improved access to goods and information for millions of people. But we don't always make the connection between the tax we pay and the services that benefit us. And when government programs work well, we sometimes forget that they're there at all. So maybe this was an important time in history after all. Just some random thoughts from this old podcaster. Hard to believe, but that was episode number 539. I want to thank Apple Sharon, Brinks302, and Randall Shield for your stories today. All really good stuff. If you want to follow the podcast or the blog, head to ronsamazingstories.com. There you will find any of the links I mentioned and how to contact us. Do you want to help the show? The best thing you can do is to tell your friends all about it and please leave reviews or feedback wherever you listen. Clicking that follow or like button makes us grow. Thank you for listening, and I hope you come again to find out what are Ron's Amazing Stories. All of the vintage audio used in the podcast is believed to be in the public domain. Ron's Amazing Stories does not own the rights to any of the old-time radio used here. If you hold the rights to any of the shows played, please contact us immediately at ronsamazingstories.com.